thinking about how can I help young people make healthy and optimal transitions from environments that they're not familiar with to the environments that they find themselves in. And that's what started my curiosity in doing research on my own and then going for my master's and then eventually my doctorate where my dissertation was on transitions of uh, teenagers. Excellent. And that is... I mean, we all know, we all say, oh, those high school years or those college years. Um, there's a, there's always transitions in adults. You go from the single yes. life possibly to the married life and the married mm-hmm. life to the parent life and uh, so forth. But um, it, it takes a special person to want to really get into it, not just get through it. Um, sure. And so with that said, I would like to now, because that gives a little bit of perspective of what drives you and um, your personal story. And they, it makes sense that, uh, you know, there's writing, there's psychology, there's wanting people to find their way. Let's talk briefly yes. about uh, your book, because uh, you described it as the three main parts. It was riffs, remedies, and rewards. Um, mm-hmm. And also, let's give the full title and also tell people where they can find you, your website, and also um, the book and, and where uh, it's easily available too. Well, the the my I'll start off with my website. My website is is the name of my company, which is Curative Connections. That's spelled C U R A T I V E Connections with an S on the end, um, because. I believe that healing starts when connections are made. And so with that said, the name of my book is called What Mothers Never Tell Their Daughters, Five Keys to Building Trust, Restoring Connection, and Strengthening Relationships. And what I've done with that book is I I um, wanted to, I found myself wanting to consolidate and distill down what I've noticed in the 20 plus years of doing therapy and the women that I've encountered, the young women that I've encountered, the do- who are daughters and or mothers, and distill it down to um, what three areas do rifts occur. Um, one is areas in, uh, is, is what, we ca- what I call how they see each other, how they understand each other, and how they communicate with each other. And I have some terms for that in my book. Um, but I cover those three riffs. Uh, and then I move into the remedy section, which is section two of the book, where I distill down 20 plus years again of how I actually work as a clinician with my clients, whether they're um, you know, individuals or teams or students or student athletes. And I distill down What's the arc of what it is that I try to work people through? And I have, I've distilled it down to five keys. Um, my, my publisher wanted me to call it keys. I really don't see folks as um, cookie cutters where I can tell them do step one, do step two, do step three, and you, you get your result because I believe that people and their situations are unique as well as their individual. And so what I've done is I've identified what I call five things for folks to consider. And it, those considerations, my publisher said, call them keys. So I call them keys. And, um, and those things are, uh, you know, consider how you face things, consider how you clarify stuff with folks, consider how you, um, uh, and I, I, I do a play off some stuff, but those are like the first two that I'll get, get folks started on. And then I cover the rest in the book. And I like that you, uh, just mentioned that, uh, you don't like the cookie cutters because that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I tell guests in the show, there's no, uh, no top 10 lists, no five must things to do, no five must things to avoid, um, because it just puts us in that black and white world. And, and that's, mm-hmm. you know, that's the end is the edges of the bell curve. It's the gray in the middle of where <laughs> we live. Right. Correct. <laughs> I and, totally agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what I like the way you just described that there. And we'll definitely be, dr- be drilling down into that. But I think it's just really important that um, we begin to, even if someone is giving you a list and there's nothing wrong, there are, there's a lot of great <laughs> books out there that are mm-hmm. presented in that form. Because as you say, their editors will tell them, no, no, you got to present it this way if you want it to be seen. But I, I really encourage people to 
take the numbers off or the bullet points um, and just say, well, it's a box of tools here on this page and which ones are the right ones uh, for me. Um, mm -hmm. But what about um, the rewards? Um, you the talked about some of the remedies and things like that. Right. So the reward section of the book um, really is uh, for those folks who, because I know there's some people out there who like to just go to the end of the book because <laughs> they're in the midst of everything. So I, I have the reward section where they can actually get some a better feel for, okay, if you were to have started with page one and gone to the end, these are the things you can expect to get as a result of it. Uh, say one of them, the rewards is you you will get closer to whether if you're a daughter, you'll get closer to your mother. If you're a mother, you'll get closer to your daughter. But I actually do a different spin on what closeness is really is um, in the books. But that's like one of the things that I mentioned in the rewards section. And then so that so that's the way the book is structured, the riffs, the remedies, the rewards. And then at the end of most of the chapters, I have uh, what I call a code cracker, because sometimes, you know, I've often heard and I've said it myself, you know, it's like, I don't understand you <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so what I wanted to do is give moms and daughters like a, a question that goes beneath the surface that can be used to start a conversation between the two of them. And it's just one question at the end of most of the chapters. So that's how the book is structured. I, I like that. And in particular, the fact that, uh, and my wife is one that um, we just came back vacation and she'll always find um, books and, you know, the paperbacks and, you know, whether they're um, <laughs> the Harlequin romance or a mystery <laughs> or whatever it is. But the first uh -huh. thing she does is read the last page. <laughs> So they're out there. <laughs> yes. And then she marches through the whole book, which I can't do. Um, but I, because I always wonder, but where are the useful parts? And I love <laughs> the fact that, um, you know, it gets down to, well, this is what you'll get out of it. But reading these words don't, doesn't make that so. You know, this, you're just reading the words of what's happening. Sure. You've still got to go experience it. And right. the fact, I also think that um, books that, um, you can bend a page into and leave it bent like that, not mm -hmm. because that's where you left off reading, but hey, there's something here, you know, that I want to come back to, you know, in this chapter. Um, I think that's been one of the, is it me or is that a, is that a change in how a lot of books are being presented, less academically and more almost workbook-ish? <laughs> Yes, and that was one of my um, my goals. I did not. I I even though I'm in the, a psychologist by training, I don't like what I call psychobabble, and I really just wanted the book to be accessible to folks so that yes, they can bend pages because they find something useful. Because I've not quote unquote preached to them or talked down to them, but actually um, the the way the book. Um, is uh, I guess the flavor of it. It's as if we're sitting having coffee at Starbucks, and I'm just yapping. <laughs> well, so and, and that's what you know. That's that's perfect for this show, and that's really I think for people <laughs> to take things in because we have enough to study. I mean, whether oh, yeah. it's where to be with our kids, how the paperwork to fill out to get them into school, sports, <laughs> you know, our, our own work things. I mean, I think we all go through about every 18 months we have to figure out um, a new health insurance and how to enroll. I mean, we're, we're right. full of reading through manuals. Right. So um, I, I found that the stuff I'm reading these days, including, you know, books like yours are uh -huh. – um, they're enjoyable by topic. I would say I would never be reading that. It's too serious for my free time to be reading that. But they're, but I, I just love it when they're delivered. <clears throat> excuse me, in a way that y you can just stop reading, mm -hmm. and you can come back or hop around, like I say. And and it really does become the parts that are worth something to you become a part of you. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I actually want folks to feel like I'm with them on that journey because. I might not have the exact same experiences or they might not have the exact same experiences as I do, but the emotion and the struggles are similar. And so I just wanted them to feel like I'm with them in the midst of it. And, you know, I didn't want to go back to it, but I've got to now. You mentioned <laughs> that there were a few kinds of riffs and a handful of remedies. Let's... Mm -hmm. um, 
But can you go through a few of those, enough to get people to kind of uh, really get a feel for what they can get from the book? Well, um, so so let's start with one of the riffs. Uh, I call it uh, a misconception. Uh, now, we've heard, we hear that word all the time, but a misconception can be, I saw something incorrectly, or it could be a conception. When you conceive something, it's a thought that then gives birth to something. Um, and so you can look at it both ways. And I found that a lot of times where we are at the time that we're either finding out that we're pregnant when I'm talking to moms now, either finding out that we're pregnant or are giving birth or are raising the children, the situations we find ourselves in inform or affect the way in which we start thinking about not just ourselves, but the young life that we've birthed. And that, that, that if we don't, if we're not um, aware of how those external factors are impacting us, then we have misses. We'll miss the opportunity. We'll miss the connection with our child in certain circumstances because we're not aware. So that's just an example of one of the riffs. Can you give an example, whether it's, you know, someone you've run into or um, part of your life? What's what's a specific one? Because, again, as a, as a guy, I'm also trying to – my wife's – she's, you know, uh, born and raised for uh, wonderful girls, and it's mm-hmm. – it's an interesting, I mean, all I can do is watch, I mean, afterwards as to the, how the relationship grows. But um, what are, what would be an example of something that can kind of um, lead to a potential missing of a connection? And what type of connection? Oh, so like, for instance, um, uh, there's a, 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 I get emails, I've been getting emails from mothers <laughs> since writing this book, and it's very humbling. Um, but one mother, um, I'll, I'll call her Lisa just for sake, for the sake of this conversation. Um, one mother wrote me and she said, you know, um, my daughter and I have had a serious falling out. Uh, and when I was reading your book, it brought me back to, and she mentioned the particular stressor that was going on in her life um, in terms of a relationship that she was in when she had her daughter and that that rela- that stressor um, led her to not understand when her daughter would quote unquote act out. Um, and so instead of her ch- being able to um, meet her daughter in her daughter's feelings, she ended up being more judgmental. And she said to me in the email, she said, I didn't realize that um, I was trying so hard to protect my daughter from the, the experiencing the same relationship type of stressor that I had experienced. She had, she, it didn't dawn on her that that was what was feeding into her missing that connection with her daughter. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, there are, it's essentially, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but there is, there'll be something that causes a fear and fear causes us to do things that we'd swear would keep us safe or those who we love safe. And that's not necessarily the outcome. Correct. I agree. That's exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I, the way I put it sometimes is, um, you know, when I when I'm acting nuts, it's because that's what I am inside. I I, I don't have it together. There's no mm-hmm. you can't explain why I did it because mm-hmm. I'm not. There's something driving me that I've lost. You know my my sense of being rational and and connecting with people. And I, and that's interesting too when you say that. When I think about it now, mm-hmm. just as you know, as a coworker, as a friend, as a teammate, as a father, uh, as a husband, one. I've been at my worst. It's when something got me so upset because I was scared of some outcome that I actually broke the connection with that person. You know, right. I was just treating them as an object and just inflicting upon them some control I was trying to to bring back. Um, right. And actually, uh, um, I, I even though the book is entitled "What Mo- It's About Mothers," what mothers never tell their daughters, I do do I do give shout outs to the dads, <laughs> uh, in that where you were just saying, you know, this is how you you missed it, missed the connection. You know, if if a mom 
is having difficulty, the fact that you are supporting your wife in that, that counterbalance. 